like to invite uh, FGC Plasma Solutions to the stage. Good morning, everyone. I'm Felipe Gomez Lacampo, the founder and the CEO of FGC Plasma Solutions. But I'm also the last thing standing between all of you and lunch, so I'll try to keep this enjoyable. Uh, basically, we're working on better fuel injectors for jet engines and gas turbines that use plasma to change how we burn fuel. And that can reduce fuel consumption and emissions. So this actually started uh, about six years ago as a high school science fair, doing things I probably shouldn't have done in my garage, and interested in seeing how plasmas and flames interacted and how we could use that for a practical purpose. And that really settled on thinking, you know, how can we do something about combustion in jet engines, right, to save on some of the huge fuel bills that airlines currently have. I ended up presenting this at the International Science Fair, and when I was flying back, one of my teachers pointed out the window and said, can you imagine if in you know, 10 years, every aircraft flying is more efficient because of something that you made? I thought, well, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, so I sort of took that as motivation and kept working on, on this technology. And it, and it turns out that it is a really big problem, right? Airlines spent $30 billion on fuel in 2015. Um, obviously, fuel prices have gone down a little bit, but it's still their largest single operating expense. So they're really sensitive to it. And because of that and regulatory pressures, uh, there's a lot of motivation to make both airplanes and engines as efficient as possible. So it doesn't really sound like the most low-hanging fruit for a combustion technology, but it turns out that jet engines are really designed to do three things. Number one, obviously to never ever shut down or else all your passengers are going swimming. Uh, number two, to be at your design point um, efficiency at cruise, right? And number three, to provide the thrust you need at takeoff. But at other conditions, say when you're at low power, uh, holding on the runway or, or descending, the engines are really not as good and there's still room for improvement. So that's where our technology comes in. Uh, think, you know, as, a, as an analog, when you're in your car and you're waiting at a stop sign or at a light, your engine is running and you're just burning fuel. So that destroys your, your uh, mileage, right? And airlines, essentially the same thing happens. So when you're taking off from a busy airport, say LaGuardia on a Friday afternoon, and your pilot says, okay, we're number 26 for departure, you're gonna be sitting there for an hour with your engines running, burning 400 pounds per hour of fuel. Our technology can help those engines keep running, right, because it's not easy to shut them down and start them back up again, like some of the start-stop systems in cars, but keep running at a lower fuel flow rate. So we think we can save between one to 5% on fuel consumption. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but that translates to around $750 million in savings for just US airlines, right? Not considering private aviation, general aviation, DOD, or, uh, any international flights. That's about a 3% increase in profitability based on uh, 2015's numbers and around a 20 million ton decrease in CO2. So even those small savings get to be pretty significant. Now, how do we go about this? Well, it turns out that jet engine combustion and jet engines in general are really complicated. Uh, in your combustor, you have a lot of factors that you have to trade off uh, to essentially design your engine. And Engineers and designers really only have one knob to control the balance between all of these factors, right? So essentially they have to do tricky things with the aerodynamics to make sure that the flame is always stable. So if you only have one knob to, to control your system, you're always gonna give something up, right? You have this balance between safety and reliability, your optimal operation, and uh, efficiency, right? And if generally the knob ends up getting turned towards safety, so there's always something you give up. If we had another knob, uh, then we can all of a sudden design a better system, right? So where do we get this knob? And it turns out we can use plasma. You can use plasma to improve how you stabilize flames inside engines and all of a sudden your design space opens and you can design a much better engine. So what is plasma? Plasma is the fourth state of matter, right? It's uh, what you'd find in, in lightning or what you'd find in uh, fluorescent light. Essentially it's a soup of charged particles with a lot of energy. They're all flying around and they can bump into other molecules and break them apart. When you do that, uh, you can essentially accelerate the rates of different chemical reactions. So for us, that's combustion, and you can do some really useful things with that. Uh, and you can actually generate plasma in the lab. So this is a picture we took at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, all you need to do is put a potential difference across air. Uh, you see a really nice picture shot with a Rebel XTI, incidentally. Uh, and because plasma is so easy to make, you know, a lot of people have played around with this idea of plasma-assisted combustion, right? How can you use plasma to control flames because there's some really interesting physics. And there's been a lot of universities, a lot of different engine manufacturers that have looked into how to do this. Uh, but the challenge has really been getting this, right, so a plasma you can generate in the lab, into this, right, taking that fundamental science and putting it at the service of some technology that can actually do something. Uh, so that's sort of the, the challenge that we took. 
And our idea was to take an existing part in the engine, the fuel injector, right? I've got a piece of one of these in my hand, uh, and modify it to accept the plasma, and then we can get this plasma in the combustion chamber and start doing you know, uh, all these sort of great things with, with combustion. So we didn't invent plasma. We didn't invent plasma-assisted combustion. We didn't, weren't even the first ones to think of how to put it in a fuel injector. But we were the first ones to solve some of the problems that other engine manufacturers had had when they did this, right? Um, so we, we have a patent on this technology issued in the US and in Europe and two other pending ones on control systems and sort of different applications. Uh, we've done pretty extensive testing on this technology, including demonstrating this at realistic conditions. So all of the previous uh, times that people have looked at plasma, they essentially did it in a lab in a simple you know, Bunsen burner type flame. But once you brought it to you know, conditions that you might find in an engine, right, at a higher TRL, then everything sort of fell apart. So the engine manufacturers we talked to initially said, you know, if this is really going to be interesting for us, you have to show it working uh, at conditions like you'd find in an engine, right? where you capture all the physics of the problem and you can show this could actually work. So we worked with NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland with a cooperative agreement, so a space act, to show that this would work at conditions like you'd find in a jet engine. So we went to higher temperatures, higher pressures, uh, real jet A, and higher mass flow rates. And we saw that we actually did solve some of the problems that engine manufacturers had previously had when they tried to implement plasma in, in their different engines. So I'll show you a little bit of how this works. So we have videos from, uh, from NASA, but I'm gonna show you the video from Case because it was shot with a Canon and it's a little bit of a better video quality. <laughs> you can play it, Robin. <laughs> But essentially what you'll see here is we've got, we've got an injector, just like you'd find in an engine. Um, we turn on the plasma and we can ignite it if it's, if it's gonna play. Is it? it was playing earlier. This is always a, the difficulty with putting videos in, uh, in PowerPoints. But anyway, I'll, I'll guess I'll, I'll talk through it. Essentially, um, we show that you can you know, use plasma to turn on a flame and then you decrease the power in the flame so you decrease the concentration of fuel. At some point, the flame extinguishes and then when you turn on the plasma, you can keep it lit with up to 60% less fuel. So keeping that flame lit with less fuel is actually how we go about delivering the fuel savings at low powers. Now, that's all the science, but what does this mean in terms of the economics of this? Well, if you take, say, an average regional flight on Embraer 190, it's, uh, short, say, a short 90-minute hop, based on our models, that's about a 2.5% increase in efficiency. So that translates to about $200 per flight, which doesn't sound that significant, but you have four, flight, four or five flights per day. So over the lifetime of that aircraft, that turns into about $6.5 million in, in savings, right? So that ends up being pretty significant. Um, the, the notional price point we've used here is about $300K per, uh, per aircraft. So we're never gonna make these fuel injectors and sell them direct to airlines or direct to engine manufacturers. This is really some sort of uh, IP transaction. But we needed to know that there was some sort of commercially viable proposition, right? That we could eventually sell this or someone could sell this for less than it was gonna cost to make. And at this price point, we're a little bit cheaper than, than winglets. Uh, so the little extensions you see on the, on the edges of, uh, of wings and, on aircraft, and those save a pretty similar uh, percentage of fuel. So it's a similar value proposition, and from that we derive that airlines will, uh, will pay around 400K for every 1% of a fuel burn, increase per year, fuel burn decrease per year. Uh, so how are we going to get there? Well, not counting work I did in my garage or in undergrad, uh, we've done about two years of testing at Case Western Reserve University and at NASA Glenn. Uh, we're currently funded by DOE out of Argonne National Laboratory. So we've got a pretty similar facility to what we have at NASA, but it's sort of uh, under our control. So what we're working on is translating what we demonstrated at NASA to injectors from actual engine manufacturers, right? So not just on a generic uh, academic concept where We've got a collaboration with two established engine manufacturers. Uh, one of them is one of the big three, and then one of them is a smaller uh, microturbine manufacturer called Capstone. Uh, and essentially, we're working on putting our technology on their engines and building up to larger and larger demonstrations. Uh, we're currently raising a $1.5 million seed round to keep funding this in addition to the, the grants we've applied for. Um, but essentially, once we've, we've finished our demonstrations at Argonne, we'll focus on larger scale demonstrations of this technology. Those usually happen with uh, significant NASA or Air Force involvement, working on some of NASA's uh, big test facilities, again, at NASA Glenn. And eventually, we think we can license this technology after the full combustor run. Uh, so that's probably in the 2020 time frame, and first flight is hopefully 2022. So that fits nicely into the 10-year uh, from high school science fair industry standard timeline for 
commercializing technologies. So even that's not a super uh, palatable proposition for investors. So there's actually a near-term entry market, which is what we're funded by DOE to work on, which is applying this technology not just to jet engines, but to stationary power turbines, which obviously don't have as many regulatory barriers, are a little bit easier to get into, and are at a smaller scale. So we're working on demonstrating this technology at full scale on a uh, small micro turbine used for distributed generation applications. So we actually have one of those at the lab, and we expect to, to run that in the second quarter of this year. So here's, here's our lab at Argonne. We've got this, uh, this setup that we built to rapidly test a wide variety of injectors. So even though we have uh, collaborations with two engine manufacturers, we're definitely open to more and open to testing different concepts. Uh, we're also working on developing our CFD capability so that when we sell this technology, we'll not only sell, hey, here's this technology which you can implement in your engines, but here are the rules and tools that you can use or that you can pay us to use uh, to put this on all of your different engines, right? Because injectors are sort of like spark plugs in your car that you can go to AutoZone and every different uh, car engine model has a different type of injector, right? So there's opportunities for a lot of non-recurring innovation. Uh, and other than that, we have about $2.8 million in, in pending proposals. And that's the, the capstone turbine that we'll eventually run this technology on. So when I started this, I was really thinking of how we, can we do something to improve combustion in jet engines? But there are a lot of other applications of combustion that our technology can help improve. Uh, one of them is power, which we found is going to be a near-term entry market. The value proposition there is pretty similar. But there's other pretty out-of-the-box things that we're working on. So one of them is waste remediation in space. Uh, we're involved in some center innovation funding uh, directed research at uh, NASA Glenn Research Center trying to use plasma to improve uh, some waste remediation processes in space. And some of the things I'm most excited about are the defense applications of this technology. So even though, uh, even though combustion in jet engines is, is a pretty critical application, uh, there's some national security applications that are even more critical. Think uh, hypersonic engines. So we have some really interesting uh, proposals and we're really excited about that we wrote to DARPA to see if we can uh, get some of our scramjet work funded. Uh, and looking at our more sort of traditional technology that we've been developing that can enable fuel savings for the military, lighter and more reliable engines, and improvements in altitude relay. So it's not just me working in this. I've got a team of all aerospace engineers and one finance guy that we let hang around with us. Uh, I'll have my master's once I finish my, my thesis. Uh, but part of what we need the funding for is to bring on two of the additional team members on full time. Uh, so with that, I'll take uh, any questions. Hey, I've got a quick question. It's probably pretty obvious, but you said you're working with the engine manufacturers. I mean, an airline's not going to put this on unless an engine certifies it, essentially. I mean, so if you... How's that going? I guess I'm just curious. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's the... Uh, you know, the, engine, the airlines are not going to buy direct from us, and we're also not going to certify the product, right? Because you don't certify a jet engine injector, you certify the new engine with the injector, right? So our challenge is not to certify a product, but to deliver a certifiable product, right? That's why we're working so closely with the engine manufacturers. So uh, eventually, you know, once we finish the R&D and once essentially we've carried this as far as we can, this would go into a new certification of the engine. So the the best shot is a completely new engine design. So that's sort of waiting on a new uh, aircraft design. So depending on what happens with the, uh, if there's a new middle of the market aircraft or a 757 replacement, that's one of the things we're following really closely because that could uh, line up nicely for a timeline of, of a clean sheet engine design that we could go on and then not essentially add any additional certification uh, expense. For your near-term market, do you have any uh, indication of what your energy savings will be? Yeah, so for, for the, um, there's a couple different things in, in power, right? So those gas turbines generally run at their maximum uh, efficiency, right, at, at full power almost all the time. So the value proposition there is more a NOx reduction, uh, which is a really regulated pollutant, especially in markets like California and Florida, and a fuel flexibility play. With the, uh, if you want to talk about the same value proposition, so the fuel savings, that's talking more about peaker type plants, right? So let's say in markets where you have a lot of renewables, you need to have a lot of spinning reserve capacity that can turn on quickly to start generating power when the wind stops blowing or when the sun sets. Uh, 
that is, is around the uh, 20 to 25% uh, fuel savings because in the day those operate, they essentially have to be generating power. Uh, they essentially have to be running, they can't shut down, but you, know, you want to minimize the fuel flow rate going to them. So that's around that order of magnitude, the 20 to 25%. Uh, there's not too many of those installations though, so that's a much smaller market. I think it was a great presentation and uh, totally agree with you that uh, the relationship with the jet engine manufacturer is key. Uh, the downside, there are only three right, jet right. engine manufacturer at that scale, uh, GE, Rolls-Royce, maybe another, right? Pratt, so, yeah. So I was wondering, you know, what's your take in developing industrial relationship and eventually trying that route for uh, getting funding uh, from a more generalist uh, manufacturer that may have a play with jet engine, like, for example, people of the like of Bosch uh, that may be interested into this? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because I always thought it was going to be the corporate venture arm of whatever engine manufacturer we were working on that would fund this. But um, it'll likely be some sort of combination. So we need to take our government funding as far as we can to take as much risk as possible and then see where we can build a coalition of you know, some of the engine manufacturers, strategic venture arms, some of the airframe manufacturers, strategic venture arms, and then some, some of the maybe second tier suppliers like uh, Praxime or, or Bosch or Parker that may have uh, some play in, in different fuel systems components, right? Yeah, so. But my view, I would try to stay as far as possible for taking money from one of the three because then uh, you're basically going to go work for them. The right. more you can be independent, uh, government is definitely a great validation. The more you can play with uh, uh, each one of them. I mean, the moment you take a check from GE, uh, you're going to work for GE for the rest of the life of this company. Which there are definitely worse things. Uh, <laughs> True. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, that, that, that's, it's a difficult balance we have to walk. All right, Felipe. I... Uh, I bring with me questions that we want to give you a chance to answer from some PhDs back uh, with whom I work with that are more than twice your age and uh, are very excited about what uh, they're hearing about these things. But their concern was, well, make him address um, what he knows about just uh, being able to operate in the full envelope of conditions uh, that you experience. And then I saw you had a bullet on there about for defense applications where there's possible envelope expansion. So talk to that. Sure, so uh, first on the full, the full envelope question. Uh, really where you need this is in transients and in off design. So when you're at full power, uh, your combustion is 99. 5% efficient, and there's not much you can do. You probably don't want this system on because it would just uh, waste energy. So when you really, you know, the, it has to be designed to operate and to, to exist in the engine at those conditions, which uh, it's a pretty small modification to the engine. So that's, that we don't think is a problem. Um, where we still have some work to, uh, to see what, how this works, right, essentially is, is in transit. So for example, slam deceleration, if you suddenly pull the power back and the inertia of your your turbo machinery keeps the airflow rate uh, much higher than your fuel flow rate. You have to keep your combustion stable, so that's one we have to look at. And the other is altitude relight. So that's some of the things we're, some of the things we're trying to uh, schedule some time with AFRL. So those are the two conditions that we, we haven't looked at that we think there's, there's a benefit at. But our, our baseline, four to five atmospheres, uh, 400 to 500 degree in the temperature with Jet A, is, that's pretty well characterized. And can you address the, the potential you propose for envelope expansion? Oh, right, right. So, so in terms of envelope expansion, uh, different fa there's different factors that limit uh, envelope, right? So one of them that we think is, is the lowest hanging fruit is uh, afterburner relight. So if you go to higher altitudes, lower pressures, it's much more difficult to, re to relight your afterburner. Uh, that's where we think we, we've got an, uh, an SBIR in, in proposal in for that. Uh, so that's, that's one of the envelope expansion mechanisms, right? The other one are uh, instability boundaries, right? So there's places that the engines are designed to go, but your combustion gets really unstable and really unhappy if you go there, and those are sort of difficult to predict until you design the full engine. So we think there's a plasma-based active control uh, technology that we can use. So that was one of the other patents that we've, that we've filed uh, to dynamically control combustion in, in those situations. So the one thing we might not be able to necessarily do 
is uh, if you have an engine that has nil power at a certain uh, thrust, it's not like you're going to be able to uh, switch on this technology and necessarily with the same design get more thrust out of it. But it would enable you to design a more pack, compact combustor or a more power dense combustor from, from clean sheet, if that answers your question. Yeah, that helps. So you dressed, you think it's afterburner compatible? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a different configuration, but the same idea of, uh, of using plasma, the uh, same sort of rules and tools we've learned of where the plasma needs to go, what the parameters need to be, absolutely should work in afterburners. And actually, afterburners should work better because it's a little bit easier to generate a plasma there. And how about, because you mentioned relight, uh, right. hydrazine relight compatible? Uh, well, I mean, it would definitely be hydrazine relight compatible, but the idea is that you wouldn't have to use hydrazine. Right. Um, so, you, for example, on um, I think like an F F16 uh, auxiliary power unit or the hydrazine generator, uh, you might be able to just relight using just the plasma in the uh, in the cold stream. Right. That would be a very uh, interesting thing to explore because that would be as bad as hydrazine is. That would be all on its own. That would be an interesting uh, market area. So. Right. Right. That's something that uh, probably talk offline about looking yes. at more. Thank you. Sure. Well done. Felipe, when I was 24, I was running nuclear power plants on submarines. You made me realize how stupid I was when I was 24 and how I was wasting my life. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not sure what I would do at a nuclear power plant right now, so <laughs> to each his own. Good luck. Good job. Thank you.